All right, Bob Walsh, head of NEA Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us. Um, so what's happening today? Well, today uh, our attorneys are going into Rhode Island Superior Court to file uh, to stop the implementation of the Rhode Island Retirement Security Act as it pertains to retirees and vested employees, uh, teachers, state employees, uh, employees in the state-run municipal employment retirement system. Why are you doing this? Uh, we believe and have said since this situation started that the legislation is a violation of the Rhode Island Constitution. It violates the due process contract and takings clause of the Rhode Island State Constitution. Constitutional issues take precedence in court. Uh, so we are asking for immediate relief, either temporary restraining order or a permanent injunction to stop the implementation of these changes on uh, the parties that I've mentioned. So you, you're hoping to prevent the changes going in, into place by July 1st? Yes, we are hoping to stop that. Uh, barring that, we expect that at some point there will be a full and fair hearing of all the underlying issues. Um, as we've stated in the past, we believe uh, that we can prove our case that there were more reasonable alternatives for the state to undertake. Uh, there are numerous examples. Some of the municipalities who have dealt with similar situations have done things that we suggested as part of the solution for the state. Like what? Uh, for instance, uh, part of this uh, uh, change involved a 25-year amortization of the state pension plan. 30-year reamortization is, is a fairly standard thing. That's something that Providence has undertaken. Uh, we believe there were other funding sources available to help mitigate these damages. Funding sources um, tax increases. Uh, possibly tax increases. Um, more recently, the state apparently has expressed its desire to meet a not legal but a moral obligation due to the uh, Schilling 38 Studios meltdown. That's a $100 million obligation that they are under absolutely no legal requirement to entertain. If you're standing in court comparing the legal constitutional basis of pensions versus a moral, not legal obligation for a fly-by-night operation, we think that the money is better spent going into the pockets of Rhode Islanders who, to whom commitments were made. That sounds nice, but yeah. you're, you're saying we think default. <laughs> you're saying default on bond payments. No, no. Well, first of all, there is no default. We have no legal obligation to those bond payments. But I'm saying that the state cannot make payments that are merely a gratuity when they have an overriding legal contractual obligation to pension to pensioners and existing state employees, uh, teachers, and uh, municipal employees. When the, when the comparison is made under the legal standard, you we're guys are first in line. alternatives, we're first in line. Okay. Um, in April, uh, we asked Gina Raimondo, State Treasurer Gina Raimondo, uh, what would happen if the state lost a lawsuit? And we, this has been expected. Today has been expected. And, and she said that it would be a, quote, devastating. She said, if that law is repealed, the municipalities will have to find $100 million next year alone. You will see devastation, I believe, in municipalities not being able to pay those bills. She was then asked, do, do you think we'll see more filing for bankruptcy? And she said, it's, it's possible. Respond to that. Well, the response to that is under the uh, prior gubernatorial administration, the Kacheri administration, significant resources were cut from our locals and cities and towns. The state did not meet their obligations to the locals and cities and towns. Um, I, I think Gina's statement is, uh, is part of the manufactured crisis that, that this started out as. Uh, they, they went too far all at once in not only reducing the expected rate of return in, in making the changes all at once to the actuarial data. We were fully aware there were situations that needed to be dealt with in the pension plan. But in the, she was referring to the municipal problems. Let's talk about the 114 plans uh, under the state MERS system. One of those plans went from 120-something percent funded to 140 percent funded. Her broad brush approach to this problem was not well thought out. The research was not done. The homework wasn't done. And while the treasurer says she followed the math, she forgot to follow the law. And the law is paramount. The Constitution takes precedent over anything else. Once we win this lawsuit, I'm sure we'll be happy to sit down and have a negotiation, a negotiated conversation, which is not only what should have been done in the first place, but it's the same advice the treasurer has given to the municipalities who don't participate in the state system. We told them this was coming. They have no one to blame but themselves. They panicked. They thought this was a weapon of mass destruction, this unfunded liability. They drank the Kool-Aid and they made a terrible legal mistake and we're a year behind in rectifying the problem because of their mistake.
so many follow-ups on that. I, I, I want to get back to your manufactured crisis thing in a second, but all right, let's say you win the lawsuit and you say, then we'll sit down at the table. So what would be on the table for labor unions to change to try and well, rectify that? Well, that's, that's a conversation after we win the lawsuit. We were more than happy to have no, that Bob, conversation. You know this I, wrote an, I wrote an op-ed about this a year and a half ago saying the types of things I think would be reasonable changes would for you, the pension. Would you allow so. COLAs to be frozen? Not until for 20 years, not to have, not until some artificial benchmark is made, not without judging uh, between the potential damage in different categories of retiree. I mean, I do think, and this is my personal opinion, not a legal opinion, there's a significant difference between a pensioner making $120,000 a year, who I guarantee you is not a union retiree, and a pensioner making $25,000 a year, which is where the average state employee pension is. But not who you represent. No, I represent. Oh, that's not true. I represent not only teachers, but I represent state employees as well. And teachers making forty-two thousand dollars a year on average as a pension. Remember, half of those are not in the Social Security system. Now they acknowledge in these changes, hey, there's something different about teachers not in Social Security. So we'll do something different for them as long as they're active employees. But they didn't give that same consideration to those who are already retired and have no ability to remediate that damage. This was a profoundly poorly thought out solution. All right, and I, I know Ted wants to jump in, but just back to your manufactured crisis. Now this is a reference to dropping uh, the rate of return. Um, do you think, what was it before, eight and a half percent? Eight and a quarter percent. Eight and a quarter percent. Really looking at the, what the return has been over the past decade, is oh, that realistic? Well, over the past 30 years, it's been close to nine percent, and this is a 30 year pay in, 30 year pay out type pension system, so you do need a longer view. I agree that the rate of return should have been dropped from eight and a quarter percent. I thought that was too high. I think seven and a half percent is on the low side because it's based on two fundamental factors, an expected inflation rate of 2.75 percent and a real rate of return of your underlying investments of uh, four and a quarter percent. Now, 4.75 percent, that inflation rate historically has been 3%. Right there is a quarter percent difference. Right there, one-sixth of the problem goes away. And that's not an unreasonable standard, and there are plenty of people who would testify to that. Even if you were going to lower that rate of return, you could have done it in incremental steps over time, judging as, as circumstances change. Heck, they could have bought, before it blew up, the Kurt Schilling bonds and gotten the 7% re-interest rate on those in the so-called conservative part of a bond portfolio. Uh, I wouldn't have recommended that investment. But. Uh, we have 11 percent unemployment in Rhode Island. We have a relatively poor state compared to Massachusetts and Connecticut. We have a lot of cities and towns that are struggling. The union movement was about solidarity across the working and middle classes. A lot of people are going to listen to you and say, wow, he wants to raise my taxes. He doesn't get it. These people have a guaranteed payment coming to them, even if it's not going to go up for a number of years. What do you say to that person? Not to the Gina Armandos of the world. To that person at home who maybe is working two jobs. Well, that they might be working three jobs because taking these funds out of the Rhode Island economy, 85% of our retirees stay right here in the state, taking this money out of their pockets means they're not spending in a Rhode Island businesses. Our folks buy locally. The 85% of stay in Rhode Island. This is incremental income to them that allows them to go out to dinner, go to the grocery store, give money to their grandkids. That's money that's not getting spent in the local economy. And Absolutely, I 100% guarantee that mistakes were made all the way along the line in the pension plan, uh, primarily by our elected officials. And all that aside, most people in Rhode Island agree a contract's a contract, a deal's a deal, and the law has to be, and they have to come to the table and sit down and negotiate with us. They cannot ignore that obligation. I'm, I'm just struck by something to Ted's question. You, you know, you talk about sort of a stimulus. This is stimulus money. That this, when you take it away, this whatever. This is stimulus but money. But isn't it yeah. at the cost of something else? We're talking to the head of a teacher's union here. Wouldn't it that be, couldn't it be uh, at the cost of education for, uh, you know, state no, that's, of that, that, Yeah, I, that, that's, that's the false argument. You know, when the treasurer announced a report and went to crossroads to do so, she tried to set up the false dichotomy that it's either money for the homeless or money for the pension system. When the real dichotomy in Rhode Island is we cut over $100 million a year in revenue by reducing the tax rate on people making over a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's the dichotomy. There was a bill in the legislature this year that had a majority of co-sponsors in the House that would have restored the top tax rate from 5.99% to 9.99%. That would have raised 
enough money with a rate of return of seven and three quarters percent, which was reasonable, to make this whole problem go away. So don't set up the false dichotomy that they're taking money from the poor, from the homeless, from the developmentally disabled. What they're doing is they're keeping money in the pockets of those who can most afford to give it back. There's a risk to your members here, too. You could lose, and you could set a new precedent that actually this, these things can be changed. Uh, what do you think of that? Gina Raimondo is very clear. She thinks this is legal. She thinks a court yeah, is going to decide no, the police power of the state and the crisis the state is in economically is going to allow these admittedly stark and landmark changes to go through. What do you say to that? No, she, she does obviously think she'd be foolish if she thought she was wrong to go forward with this, although sometimes you get trapped on a path and locked into it. I th what I say to the treasurer on this is she went too far. She understands the legal standard, and the final legal standard in this case is were there more reasonable alternatives? We've already had other municipalities in the state prove to us there are more reasonable alternatives. 30-year amortization, different rate of return, different structure of the system, um, allowing people just on the practical not everyone is going to be able to work till age 67, and what's that going to do to disability re increase in disability retirements? God bless them if they can. We know a lot of teachers work into their 70s, even their 80s, but some can't go till age 67. That's just the physical nature of, of the job. We've got support staff members whose jobs involve lifting special needs students, literally picking them up. There comes a certain point in time where that's not done, and, and you've already heard the examples over time of uh, in the public safety side. Uh, there, are, there was a reasonable way to structure this. Ultimately, I think it gets back to that. Ultimately, I think we have a real negotiation about it, but I have to be abundantly clear. When we're in court, we're in court for, to win. The judge will not say there were more reasonable alternatives and this was it. The judge, if we're right, will say there were more reasonable alternatives. Now go back and get it right. I don't want to see you people again. And in the going back and getting it right, that's where we can sit down and negotiate the way we should have in the first place. If you get an injunction, practically speaking, does that mean your, your side expects them to put 600 something million dollars into the pension fund and the cities and towns to put in the amounts as if this had never passed but the rate of return went up? I mean, practically speaking, budgets all start for the next fiscal year within two weeks. Yeah, I would expect that by next June 30th they would have had to figure this out because that would be the last day of the next fiscal year where they figure those things out and they've done that before. I would expect that uh, when we prevail in this, one of the, uh, the solutions that will occur in a supplemental budget probably uh, after the first of the year is that they will move to a 30-year amortization, get some savings there, they'd re-examine the rate of return, and they'd sit down with us and have a conversation. But again, I, I have to be very careful to differentiate. When we're in court, we're in court to win. We're not asking the judge for compromise. That's not within the power of a judge to give. The question before the judge is, did they break the law? Were there more reasonable alternatives? Did this violate the Constitution? And you go through those questions. Were there more reasonable alternatives? Do we have lots of evidence, lots of examples that there were? And once we win that, then we're back at this. And maybe we can do it right for best for the members, best for Rhode Island, and get a comprehensive solution that's fair to everybody, because this was